Hi, my name is Krista Samuels, and I'm doing my professional development presentation on relational aggression, particularly relational aggression in girls, because um, this is a growing concern in many schools. Um, we've all seen the movie Mean Girls, and that kind of portrays relational aggression, but it is a real problem in schools. So I'm just going to begin by reading you a scenario um, that illustrates um, relational aggression. Um, Rachel and her family have just moved to a new town, and Rachel had to enroll in a new high school. She does not know anybody at the school, and she's afraid she will never get to meet new friends because she's extremely shy and uncomfortable in her new surroundings. She casually socializes with some students, but for the most part, she keeps to herself. However, one day, James, the star football player at the school, approached her and asked if he could walk home with her. Happy to have some company on the way home, she gladly said yes. She had a wonderful time during that walk, and everything was wonderful, until Maria saw James and Rachel having a good time together. Maria is James' former girlfriend, and they have been boyfriend-girlfriend on and off for the past few years. But Maria and James are no longer a couple. Seeing them, Maria was enraged. Maria felt threatened by Rachel and worried that she'd be replaced by her. Later that day, Maria told her friends about what she saw, and they were just as upset about the situation as she was. Maria convinced them to help her sabotage the reputation of Rachel. They figured that because Rachel was new to the school and nobody knew much about her, they could make it so that nobody would like her once they heard what she was all about, stealing other people's boyfriends. Soon there was a malicious rumors around the school about Rachel. Rachel was completely devastated. But what had she done to deserve this? She was none of the things that everyone was saying. Why wouldn't anyone believe her? So this case basically clearly demonstrates relational aggression, like relational bullying, um, when one feels threatened. You know, Maria is the relational bully. She's using her power um, to manipulate the situation to try to get James back and to try to make it so he doesn't date Rachel. Um, and she's using the fact that Rachel has no support at school being a new student um, to her advantage um, using her power. So this again just shows relational aggression. So now I'm going to talk about specifically what is relational aggression. Um, relational aggression is a form of bullying that is actually meant to harm a person's social relationships and damage those relationships. So it's becomes bullying when it's a repeated act that's intentional. Um, some acts include indirect and direct acts. So direct acts would be things like directly telling a person and calling them a name or um, directly threatening to terminate the relationship. And then non-threatening acts would be things, uh, non-direct acts would be things like um, spreading rumor behind their back um, and just excluding them from participation in the social group. So some common forms of relation aggression include teasing, name calling, gossiping, which is spreading rumors, withdrawing affection, intentionally excluding someone, threatening to end a relationship, even things like dirty looks and eye rolling and ignoring are forms of relational aggression. So there's some key features for relational aggression. Usually there's a power imbalance. The aggressor has higher power. There's manipulation where the aggressor manipulates the situation to um, her benefit. There's usually torment by the aggressor meant to inflict pain and cause distress. There's usually lack of empathy in terms of the aggressor, doesn't care what she's doing. Her um, emotional high of having power outweighs any of the negatives of causing guilt or pain to the other person. They don't even think they're causing pain because they don't bother to look at the situation from the victim's perspective. And it's often unexpected. People around don't know that it's happening. They're naive to the existence of relational aggression because it's what is usually covert versus overt, meaning that it's hidden. So physical aggression, like when someone starts fighting and hitting, that's um, over and people know that it's happening. Um, Cyberbullying is related to relational aggression because it's a form of um, relational bullying. It's just through the computer and through technology and on the phone. And the advantage is that the aggressor can really hide their identity behind a screen. Um, psychologists actually say the distance between the bully and the victim on the lead internet is leading to an unprecedented and often unintentional degree of brutality. So it's, you know, almost worse um, when it's done over the internet and through the computer and through phones. Like you could think about how a person can just send a mass text out or write something negative about someone on social media. So this is a form of, you know, 
relational bullying. Just some facts about relational aggression. Um, both boys and girls both engage in bullying and both engage in relational aggression, but it's really commonly seen more with girls. Girls are more often not only the bullies, but also the victims of relational aggression, um, while boys are more involved in physical aggression. Um, girls have been socialized to um, be relationally aggressive and because it's based on gender roles, it's not appropriate for girls to act physical, to get, you know, to handle their emotions. You know, they're not taught to behave in a confrontational manner. They're taught to be not aggressive. So they use relational aggression as a way to um, act out. It's actually seen more with middle school girls than with elementary and high school girls, and that's probably due to the fact that it just starts to develop during the fourth and fifth grade, and during this developmental time, peer relationships become more important, um, and that's why they target the peer relationships um, as their form of bullying. In terms of looking at ethnic and racial differences, we see that African American girls are more involved in relational aggression than European American girls, and a lot of times it's due to the fact that they're socialized. Um, in a way that makes it so they're going to be more aggressive. It's more acceptable in the African-American culture to be aggressive and to handle yourself that way. Um, so the parents are going to not be as discouraging in terms of using that um, aggressive behavior versus in the European-American culture it is discouraged. And the idea is that the more parents discourage it in the European-American um, culture, the less that the child or the girl will actually um, engage in relational aggression. Um, but sometimes they still do because there is what's called a low effect danger ratio. They see it as an effective way to get back and to harm other people because there's a low risk and that people probably won't even notice and they're not going to be identified as a bully um, versus with the more overt forms like physical aggression where people are going to obviously see them physically hurting other people. Um, why do girls engage in relational aggression is the next thing I'm going to speak about. And really, girls engage for a number of reasons. Sometimes it's just the fact that they're misinterpreting social cues and they think that someone's being disloyal to, somebody, to them and they're really not. Um, they also just use it to gain social power and become popular. Um, it's also just the way that, like, due to, again, being socialized to handle um, situations and to handle conflict this way instead of physical aggression. And the fact that they know other girls are highly valuing peer acceptance at this point in their life, they know that it's an easy target to um, harm someone's social relationships if in order to hurt them. So they target that. So feeling marginalized. Um, by peers is particularly hurtful, so the bullying strategies are going to um, target those social relationships. Um, also personality factors, like if you have social anxiety or if you have um, high hostile attribution bias, which means that you believe that everybody's just out to get you and that they're being aggressive when they're most of the times not, then you're most likely going to be involved in the relational aggression. And then also because girls just through the media and believe that this is just normal and part of being a teenage girl um, and it's really shouldn't be. So some characteristics of a girl bully, you know, a lot of times we, we look at the movie Mean Girls and it's true, a lot of times the girl bully is like that character in that movie, um, Gina, who is very pretty and smart and, you know, adults have difficulty believing she is a bully because she seems so nice, but she really, underneath all of that, is really um, harmful to other girls and really is a bully and is mean. And Wiseman, um, this researcher, explains girl bullying by looking at this hierarchy that she creates um, where there are six key players. Um, the first player is the queen bee. That's the main girl, the one on the top, who has high popularity and it's based off of fear and control. Then there's the sidekick, which is her second in command, who basically mimics and supports her behavior. Then there's the banker who has basically all of the information about everybody. So she really has what um, Wiseman calls the currency of the girl world because she has all the information that she can give to the queen bee to use to spread rumors about other people. 
The floater associates with more than one group of girls, so she's the only one that really, if pressed, will stand up to the um, bully. The um, bystander is the one that's torn between the bully and the victim, but a lot of times, as we've seen, bystanders typically go with the bully because of fear and popularity and all that. The pleaser is will do anything to basically win the favor of the queen bee and her sidekick. So that's somebody who is low on the social hierarchy who's trying to move her way up. But overall, just some defining characteristics of a relational aggressive girl. She often has low self-esteem, a negative view of herself. She misinterprets social cues. She doesn't have very high pro-social behavior. She often has um, negative externalizing and internalizing symptoms she might be depressed. She also has negative family dynamics at home, low support. She might have a history of discipline problems. So school counselors and personnel can identify bullies through both just naturalistic observations as well as surveys like the Children's Peer Relations Scale, the Social Experience Questionnaire Self-Report, the Importance of Friendship Qualities Measure, and these can be filled out by the students themselves as well as teachers and parents. You also might want to conduct focus groups with girls that will kind of go through and talk about relational aggression and they might um, discuss what you know they think makes up the relational aggressor slash bully. The characteristics of the victim, um, they're usually on the opposite of the bully. They're low on the social hierarchy. Um, their social status makes it so they're not going to probably, you know, have much help and support. They don't probably have a lot of friends. They're usually loners, socially awkward, they might be new to the school, they might be depressed or sad, they have low social skills. They might even be the diverse students, so they're ethnically, religiously, racially diverse. They also may have disabilities. Um, which again makes it so they're easy targets. Um, researchers talk about the signs of relational aggression victimization. Some signs include things like moodiness, becoming aggressive, stomach aches, and other illnesses to try to avoid going to school, drastic changes in eating and sleeping patterns, dropping in grades, withdrawal from family and friends, sadness slash crying episodes, becoming a loner, Again, we can look for victimization through um, assessment like the social anxiety scale and the children's loneliness scale, as well as reports and observations from teachers. We can use those focus groups again to see what girls, you know, think of relational um, victimization and who they believe are victims. When we talk about the effects of relational aggression, for the um, person who's victimized, it leads to depression, low self-esteem, social avoidance, loneliness, externalizing, internalizing problems, rejection. It actually can lead to suicide ideation. A report examined 13,000 adolescents and determined that adolescent females who are isolated from others are more likely at a greater risk for suicidal thoughts than those who have cohesive friendship groups. So we can see it puts them at risk for suicide, unfortunately. It also has negative effects on their schooling and their academics. A lot of times they don't want to go to school so to try to avoid the bullying, so they're absent. And that can obviously lead to poor academic performance. Um, for the bullies themselves, although they seem to be very smart in how they kind of handle social relationships in the school and how they manipulate, they often are have lower um, performance in the classroom compared to their peers. How do girls often respond to um, bullying? A lot of times it's through either retaliation, ignoring the incident, or asking the adult for help. Um, a few studies have proven that girls feel like retaliation works, which is obviously a problem because there's this idea that we can respond to bullying by bullying, um, so that's a concern that we need to address. Also, the fact is that many girls don't want to ask for help because they don't feel like adults are going to do anything, so that needs to change as well. Um, but telling teachers and adults that they need to do something and also letting students know that they need to report it because um, bullying is a serious issue. Um, a lot of times the way that the victim copes from the bullying depends on their relationship with the aggressor. Um, if they were friends beforehand, then it obviously is much hurtful when they are um, a victim of the bullying versus if they weren't really friends with the bully. Um, 
Also, if the act themselves made them very angry, angry it's going to hurt them more um, than if the act really didn't bother them so much. And then also social support is a key coping strategy to helping them with dealing with Boltony if they have somebody in the school that they feel like they can go to or have good parental support or have other friends, that's really important. So as school counselors, we can be that support and we can also encourage other students and other staff to be that support. Um, many girls show real resilience to the racial aggression, which is basically the ability to bounce back and overcome the incident. But there are certain factors that must exist, including having, you know, coping skills, high self-esteem, also things like having that support um, to help them overcome the adversity. Um, there's implications for school counselors. So what should school counselors do about relational aggression? One thing they need to do is they need to raise awareness. So it needs to be brought to the attention, you know, to key stakeholders like principals, administrators, teachers, the parents, the students themselves, and all the school staff, anyone involved in the school. You know, it can be done through in-service meetings, so assemblies, parent meetings, and really just they need to know what relational aggression is, what are the risk factors, understand the effects, the negative outcomes, so that the thing that can be done um, to fight it. Really, the school needs to make sure that they're creating a positive climate that so that students feel comfortable um, and that hopefully this relational aggression won't exist. Um, parents need to have open communication with the school so that they feel like they can talk to the school and the school counselors when they feel like their child is being bullied. Um, we also want to encourage those parents who are parents of children who have been bullied and victims of relational aggression to look for signs like changes in behavior, you know, sleeping and eating patterns and report those to the school um, so that we can kind of make sure that nothing, you know, more serious happens um, with the child after, you know, the bullying occurs. We want to make sure we're really establishing clear expectations about bullying in the school, letting students know about the laws and that, you know, bullying is not acceptable and there are clear consequences um, that need to be given out. Um, we also need to make sure we encourage students to report it when they see bullying or when no more relational aggression is occurring and you know let them know that it's okay to tell an adult maybe in the elementary schools even going in and showing them the difference between tattling and telling so that they're encouraged to to tell when aggression is happening we also make sure we're going to foster pro-social behaviors and healthy peer relationships so that can be done through guidance lessons and individual group counseling and you know helping students learn empathy and cooperation can all be done through modeling and explicit instruction and feedback. Social skills training is important so that they develop good peer relationships and know how to interact socially with others in an appropriate manner. We also want to make sure we're fostering and creating those support networks. So with other peers, with the teachers, um, so that again they feel like they have someone that they can go to because we know that again that really helps with building that resilience. Um, and buffering those negative feelings that can cause that can be caused by the aggression because again we can't necessarily stop the relational bullying but we need to you know have supports so when it does happen that those students can cope use of small groups is important because again we can do the social skills training there and help girls develop appropriate relationships but then also work with those students who are victims and bullies so that maybe we can do like conflict management um, and problem solving, you know, and using those solution focused techniques so that students learn ways to handle conflict and to compromise so that they don't act aggressive and do those negative behaviors like spread rumors and make threats and all of that. We also need to address the cyberbullying, the relational aggression that occurs online by, you know, letting people know that this is occurring, so school staff, showing them to look for signs of it and how to handle it and handle it in an appropriate manner. There is this emphasis on relational cultural theory as a way for school counselors to um, fight and handle relational aggression and basically it's the idea that we can fight relational aggression by building positive relationships between students and building healthy relationship patterns. So that's what our focus should be on through group and individual counseling as well as through classroom guidance. Should always should be focusing on relationships. Um,
We can also look to specific programs that have been implemented um, that are aimed to fight relational aggression in girls, and we can kind of use those as models and take activities from them and stuff so that um, we can fight the relational aggression in our school and develop a program. So Clubophilia is one. That's an organization that empowers the adolescent girl um, who has been victimized by relational aggression as well as the aggressor. Goodwill Girls is another group counseling program that targets relational aggression. Allies in Action is a program where it's actually for girls ages 8 to 18, and they're the actual peer facilitators, and they have open dialogues about relational aggression. Second Step is a program that is preventative in trying to teach students pro-social behaviors, um, and there's relations on appropriate social interactions, empathy, problem-solving, anger management. Another big thing is anger management leadership groups that have actually been proven to increase relational and social competencies. Um, the idea is that when students develop leadership skills, um, it increases their behavioral self-advocacy and actually provides a buffer against aggressive behavior. So these are programs that we need to implement. So just to summarize, you know, what we talked about today in this professional development presentation, we discussed what is relational aggression and relational bullying, and discussed how it is a form of bullying and that's meant to harm relationships. And a lot of times we see it in the middle school because this is where, um, among girls, because this is when they're valuing social relationships, so that's often the target of bullying is to damage those because they really depend on their peer feedback to make them feel good and um, when that's damaged, then it hurts them, and so the girl, the bully, feels successful. We talked about the characteristics of a bully and a victim and what we can look for. We talked about the effects of relational bullying um, and how, you know, it de victims are going to handle it differently, but generally, you know, has a lot of negative social and academic um, and emotional impacts on both the bully and the victim. And we talked about what school counselors need to do and how they need to create overall a self safe climate for um, students, um, as well as need to do preventative strategies to stop students from engaging in these aggressive behaviors and to have better social skills to form healthy peer relationships. Um, and then hopefully that will just stop bullying in general. And we can look to specific programs that are aimed for relational aggression. Um, you know, we like to watch the movie Mean Girls as a form of entertainment, but the truth is that this is something that's really happening in schools and it's a serious issue, so we need to stop it. Thank you for listening.